Hello there, and welcome to my series, The Finished Story Arcs of Star Wars The Clone Wars, which comprises of the three story arcs that were chosen to be finished in 2020. In this video, we'll be covering the first of these, Ahsoka's Walkabout, or as it was later called, Ahsoka's Journey. Please note, there will be spoilers for Solo, Rebels, and Resistance. Before 2020, this story arc was the third one to be left unfinished after the cancellation of the Clone Wars in March 2013, coming after the Bounty Hunter arc and Crystal Crisis on Utapel. Originally planned as Season 6's final story arc, it was initially going to be Episodes 19-22 to of that season, before becoming Episodes 22-25 to when the Rush Clovis arc got pushed to Season 6 in October 2012. This was before it was ultimately not finished when the show as a whole got cancelled. When Disney Plus ordered a 12-episode limited Clone Wars revival as part of its launch, this story arc was chosen as the second out of three to be finished. In the original production, this story arc took up production code 605 to 608 as the second arc of the Sith production season, being one of the only two arcs in that production season that would have actually aired as part of the released season 6. This was due to how the original Clone Wars production would always have more episodes in a production season than they would in a release season. The further the show went on, the less production episodes would match with their release season. Had the show continued, this would have gotten to the point where the 20 episode 7th season would have only had its last four episodes actually be from the seventh production season, with the eighth season consisting entirely of production season seven episodes, with no eighth production season known to exist due to the show's ending being planned with the eighth release season due to the upcoming Disney acquisition. When this arc was chosen to be finished for the twins' final season production, it adopted the production codes 105 to 108. This story arc was originally written by Charles Murray. Had this arc been finished as part of the original production, there would have been post-production alterations to the script compared to his story reels as is standard practice, but due to the space of time between the original script production and the production of the final season, more major alterations would have been applied. These script edits slash alterations were carried out by Dave Filoni, who would have done this for all 12 episodes of the Twins production. Thanks to the trivia gallery on StarWars.com, we have the designs created for both the original Clone Wars production that has the label The Clone Wars, and the final season production that is labelled Twins, with the dates on each corresponding to when both versions of the arc would have been in their design stage. With the original Clone Wars production version having been in this phase between May and July 2012. Had this story arc been finished as part of the original production as intended, it would have most likely released around March 2014, the same time that the Lost Missions got their release on Netflix. The most major difference with this story arc's twins version is the change of the characters who Ahsoka encounters. While we know the first one was an original character called Nix Okami, who was replaced by Trace Martez, the second character is a bit more of a mystery. Though I believe I know who Rafa replaced, something Lucasfilm would not outright tell us, but they left a clue in a hidden easter egg in the first episode of this arc that isn't actually an easter egg, but more of a residue of the original version. That is, the Orabesh in the laundromat that we first encounter Rafa Martez in. It translates to roughly Calrissian Landomat, and I think it was kept in as a nod to the original plan for this arc, while not being noticeable enough for the majority of people to catch on. Entering a bit more into speculation territory now, but I believe that originally, in the early pitching stages of this story arc, it was intended to have Ahsoka run into younger versions of both Han Solo and Lando Calrissian, but as they tried to develop the idea further, they discovered it was pretty much impossible to fit Han into the story, given the fact he thought the Jedi were nothing but a myth. In response to this, the development team came up with an original character called Nix Okami, who was pretty much a younger, inexperienced version of Han. The backstory for Nix Okami would have most likely been a similar story to Trace and Raffa's, except that Nix and Lando's bond would have been brotherly based only on the fact that Lando would have been the only person Nix had after his parents died, with Lando essentially adopting Nix as his own. I feel like the reason the only two story or clips we got from this arc are from the first episode are due to the fact that Lucasfilm wanted to keep Lando's involvement in this arc a secret, based on the chance they could have released the original version in some form in the future. As was stated in the Ahsoka's Untold Stories panel at Celebration 2016, Nyx would have been Ahsoka's so-called boyfriend. 
based on the story arc we got in the final version, this makes me believe that this would have been more of a one-sided thing on Nyx's part, with Nyx having unreciprocated feelings for Ahsoka, who was too focused on hiding her true nature as a Jedi to notice. Ahsoka being this girl who literally crashed into his life, and would be the first person he felt close to besides Lando since his parents died, leading him to create dumb decisions in failed attempts to try to impress and flirt with her, taking inspiration from Lando, who essentially has brought him up. Nix's design shows us that originally he had an overcoat slash jacket with a wolf emblem when this arc was revived for the twins production. This turned into a fur coat that according to the trivia guide was initially planned for Trace, most likely in the scenes where Nix wore his overcoat, but then switched to Ruffer when they felt it suited her more. As for Lando, I think we have actually seen his design, but not in the Clone Wars. I believe his outfit we see in Rebel Season 1 is a design they originally intended to use in the Clone Wars, but when that arc was never finished, they decided to do the classic Lucasfilm standard and repurpose an existing idea for use in a new project, with the visual style getting altered and Lando getting aged up to fit into the Rebels art style and timeline with everyone else. Since Solo A Star Wars Story released, it was most likely too difficult to keep Lando in this story arc, so they decided to replace both Lando and Nyx with two original characters. I will also note that conveniently, neither the concept art gallery on StarWars.com or the Star Wars Rebels art book shares Lando's full model sheet, potentially supporting that it was sourced from Lando's unseen Clone Wars model, with Lucasfilm not wanting to reveal it to us. Though we do see a conveniently cropped version of his design sheet from Rebels in the video Scoundrel School Lando Calrissian Returns, which interestingly, alongside his concept art, shows him in a brown outfit. Maybe this is more residue from his Clone Wars appearance, in the same way that the Shadowcaster was called the Banshee during the production of Rebels. This is in contrast to his Rebels concept art of his interaction with Hera, which shows Lando's more grey-blue outfit colour as seen in the final episode. This brown design of Lando's matches Nyx's overall colour scheme for his outfit, with them both also sharing a v-neck. With this brown potential Clone Wars design potentially representing a time when Lando was working in the criminal underworld, with more earthly colours being shown, while his blue outfit represents him working in the sky on Cloud City. The Rebels colour scheme being a bit more grey than blue, indicating the between point of him being in the Clone Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. Having Ahsoka come into this group of two guys where one is a guardian brotherly figure to the other, could have been a way for the show to give us a contrast to Ahsoka's relationship with Anakin and Obi-Wan. While this was changed in the twins' final season version to be about how Ahsoka could have become these two different types of people if she wasn't in the Jedi Order. Moving on to the first episode of the arc now, with the first topic being its name. While the final name was Gone With A Trace, due to that title's connection to Trace Bartez, it is most likely the original name was something else. Whether it was called Gone With A Nix, just the single word Nix, or some other name is unknown. Maybe it could have delved more into the brief failed romance part of the story arc and be called When Ahsoka Met Nyx. Or maybe they could have taken a more gambling angle with the name considering Nyx owes money to Pintu and is essentially mentored by Lando and be called something like Double or Nyx or Nyx or Nothing. What is known, however, is the original director, this being Carl Dunleavy, while the twins' production would have Sol Ruiz redirect the episode with the new characters and changes. The overall story of this episode would be pretty much the same as it is in the final episode, with Ahsoka being introduced into the situation where one person is clearly using the other person for their own personal gain, while exclaiming that it is what they have to do in these harsh times to get by. Ahsoka would still reminisce about leaving the Jedi, with Skywalker Academy probably still being a thing mentioned. We have a story reel clip that we got during the Untold Clone Wars panel in 2015.
All right. Oh no. <laughs> Piece of junk. I've been swindled. I should have known better than to trust a used speeder salesman. This clip, as confirmed by the final version of this episode, was actually the opening scene of the episode and story arc as a whole. The first big change is Ahsoka's outfit, with the original Ahsoka D design being more in line with her previous Ahsoka B design from season 3. The final version kept the headband and boots, but the rest were completely changed to a mechanic overall style design and lost the knife that was a part of the original. The twins version of Ahsoka D also seems to be taller than the original. Viewers may notice that the original Ahsoka D design did eventually get used in the Ahsoka novel, a story that Tales of the Jedi Season 1 decided to retell, but sadly not to use the original outfit anyway. The design being called Ahsoka D gives us another question. We don't know what design Ahsoka C was, with her Season 3 one being referred to as Ahsoka B, and her adult vision on Mortis, Karlak's snow coat, Zygeria's slave outfit, and her Onderon Jedi robes all being sub-variants of the Ahsoka B design. I can only assume that Ahsoka C was a design that was later scrapped or they wanted to skip the letter C for some unknown reason, which wasn't repeated with Ventress as seen with her Dark Disciple design name. It's always possible that Ahsoka C was some Jedi Knight design they could have had for Ahsoka had she not left at the end of the wrong Jedi that never made it past concept stage due to Ahsoka ultimately leaving the Order at the end of that episode. We got a second clip of this story arc released at the 2016 Star Wars Celebration Ahsoka's Untold Stories panel, which is also from from this episode, as confirmed by its twins version. Okami! Do you have what you owe me? Hey, Pintu. I was just coming to see you. I've been helping a new client rebuild her speeder. I was waiting for her to pay me the last few credits she owed me. So, where's my money? I'm a few credits short. Then this is going to hurt pretty bad, Okami. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, will it hurt me or you? <laughs> 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 You're doing pretty good. You can go get help anytime you want, Ahsoka. But only if you let me stay free of charge. Free? No way! Fine. Free of charge. Just go get help. That hurt. I think you want to leave now. Tell Okami his debts are far from being paid. Major differences in this clip compared to the final include Nick slash Trace owing money to Pintu instead of Lando slash Rafa, Pintu being recast from Tom Kane to Bobby Moynihan, and Nick's being knocked out while Ahsoka assaults the guards instead of watching Ahsoka like Trace does. 
the first change I can see having actually happened in the original if it ever got finished, as they would have gone back through the arc in post-production and edited it for consistency, with it making sense for Lando to owe money to pin two more than Nyx. Or maybe they could have kept it the way it was and have it explained that Nyx is trying to be like Lando, but isn't able to get away with doing dodgy deals like him. The change of Pintu's voice actor I think was done because during the years since the Clone Wars, Lucasfilm have hired more voice acting talent and wanted to involve more people. The third change I think was done due to the character change, with Trace being knocked out probably being judged as a bit too harsh, especially considering it's no longer her that even owes the debt. The rest of the episode would pretty much play out the same with Nyx and Lando in place of Trace and Rafa, with the droid running loose, causing havoc, as we have original designs for the laundromat, the droid that escapes, the rear of the repair shop, the gangster ship, and the wharf at the end of the episode. This gangster ship, as seen with its design asset sheet, is a reused asset from the fourth episode of the Unfinished Bounty Hunter arc, CW525 Sara Leonis Skiff. The Sara Leonis Skiff can actually be spotted in the background of the Unfinished Cab Bane and Boba Fett jewel clip that was released to us in 2017. The forklift seen in the episode was also in the original, as seen on Russell Chong's portfolio. The second episode I still think was titled Deal No Deal, as is the final title. Originally being directed by Stuart Lee, the final version was redirected by Nathaniel Villanueva. The first notable change we have is the Silver Angel. Thanks to the twins' designs that were shared in the trivia guide, we know that when it was owned by Nyx, its original name would have been the Black Ace. It's possible that in the original version that this was Lando's starship that he let Nyx fly for the first time. The episode would continue to play out the same as what we see in the final, but with the obvious family connection of Rafa and Trace not being as present with Lando and Nyx, but they would still have a brotherly-like bond that Lando exploits. This episode would have been the second time we saw Kessel in the Clone Wars, originally following on from the second episode of the Unfinished Bounty Hunter arc that would have aired a few months before this one had the full season 6 been completed. The Kessel Run storm cloud did not exist yet, just like it didn't in Rebels, with the Kessel Run being added as a visual only element in the final twins version of this episode. This is seen when the episode literally skips past it to land on the planet. As the second time seeing Kessel, we would have now seen the nicer, cleaner side of the planet, as confirmed by Twilight Kinash Lock's original design being shown to us. Note they've added a label on the left-hand side referring to a new Twins production asset. This would have obviously not been on the original design, showing they somewhat used the original designs as a base when updating them for the Twins production. A notable moment in this episode is when Trace dumps the spice. Now while this would have still had to have happened in the original version as to keep the plot the same, Nyx's reasoning was probably different to Trace's, where she dumps the spice because it apparently endangered her ship. Mark Krim's design confirms he was also meant to be introduced in this episode, which was meant to predate his appearance in the second episode of the Dark Disciple arc. Now with the Dark Disciple novel having been released before this arc, that has now become his first appearance. On to the third episode, which I also think kept its original name, Dangerous Debt, was originally directed by Bosco NG. The twins version was directed by Sol Ruiz. As confirmed by original production design assets of a Pike Citizen, the Pike City, and the Torture Chair, the overall plot of this episode that some people regard as filler, due to them ending up back where they started, would have been the same in the original planned version of this episode. Rafa calling Luminara beautiful is something I feel like was written for Lando. One thing not in the original episode was Bo-Katan and her Night Owls. This arc originally did not have any tie into the Siege of Mandalore, due to it being a whole two seasons ahead of it. With Ursa Wren's involvement obviously not making sense for the original version when she wasn't created until the third season of Star Wars Rebels. On to the final episode of the arc, which I think also kept its original title of Together Again. The original director of this episode was not revealed. However, as was the case with all previous season finales involving Ahsoka, I believe the original director was Dave Filoni. With Dave already being credited as executive producer and co-writer, alongside the changes this episode received, makes me believe he didn't want to be credited as the director as well. If not for some sort of clause that limits the amount of roles an individual can be credited with. 
Nathaniel Villeneuve would go on to direct the twins version that saw the light of day in a finished form. The overall plot of this episode is again the same in the original as it was in the final version. The first major change though is Maul. Maul would not have been in the original episode due to him having been locked up in Stygian Prime, as this arc was originally planned to take place in between the Lawless and Son of Daphne's first episode, The Enemy of My Enemy. While concept art shows us that the room with the hologram would have still featured in this episode, it is possible that the Pikes were working under someone else. I think the most logical person who would have been the original Pike contact would have been Olmec, with him later confirmed to be keeping the Syndicate together in Maul's absence when he escaped Stygian Prime. Maul's threat of Crimson Dawn in the final could have easily replaced Olmec threatening to inform Maul, with the Pikes being unaware that he was actually imprisoned by Palpatine. Maul, somehow sensing Ahsoka through the hologram, could have replaced her actually knocking something over, or maybe even dropping the knife on her outfit. The scene where Ahsoka discovers Maul's transmission is coming from Mandalore could have originally been a follow-up on all mech running the Shadow Collective in Maul's absence, with Ahsoka not recognising who it was in the original version, making her even more puzzled as to why it's coming from Mandalore, considering it's kind of weird that Ahsoka didn't know about the Maul stuff on Mandalore, as Obi-Wan knew firsthand, and she'd have probably heard about it while in the Order, considering she didn't leave until after those events happened, as well as Alakan obviously knowing due to how he lent Obi-Wan the Twilight. While Obi-Wan knew Maul was on Mandalore, it didn't seem that he knew about the full extent of the Shadow Collective, just that Maul himself was on Mandalore. This could imply that Ahsoka knows about the Jedi's encounter with Maul in Son of Dathomir, where he is no longer on Mandalore, hinting that she's maybe reconnected with at least Obi-Wan off-screen during the time between when she originally left the Order and this version of Walkabout. All of Bo-Katan's scenes would have again not existed in this episode's original version, as it would have not had a direct tie into an arc that was two whole seasons away. The Pike Warehouse exterior that Trace and Rafa fight the Tomb and the Trandoshan in also existed in the original version, with it obviously being Nyx and Lando fighting them instead. While we have the original version of the Tomb design, we have the Twins version of the Trandoshan, but the original production did have a Trandoshan design, as confirmed by a reference on the Tomb design. Trace's sudden re reaction from finding out that Ahsoka is a Jedi with her insistent you should have told me comes off as someone who has put all of their trust into someone they thought they knew and the reveal that she isn't who she thinks she is seems to send Trey spiralling, questioning everything about Ahsoka. Nyx probably would have acted the same but considering it would have been more apparent that he had obvious feelings for Ahsoka, I feel like this reaction would have felt less sudden. This brings me to the other major change of this story arc, the ending. Once the duo leave the Silver Angel after landing back on Coruscant. This is where I think the original version stops and the scenes after it are completely new. To me, they feel quite forced in the name of quickly wrapping up this arc and selling out a proper ending in favour of promoting the Siege of Mandalore, with Trace and Rafa making up with Ahsoka way too quickly in my opinion. Now, as we know, this arc originally had Nyx and potentially Lando, but did not have Bo-Katan or the Siege of Mandalore set up. I instead think this arc would have ended the full season 6 on a sadder note, and mirror the ending of season 5. Ahsoka would try to explain the whole situation to Nyx, but he'd ultimately side with Lando or fall out with the both of them. Ahsoka, being unable to reconcile with Nyx, who blamed the Jedi for the condition his life is in, would have her leave, adding more issue to how the public perception of the Jedi has changed into a more negative light because of the war, with it now directly affecting Ahsoka's long-term ability to connect with people. The reveal of Ahsoka being a Jedi could have caused Nyx to question everything, realising that Lando was gaslighting him for his own agenda, while also potentially thinking that Ahsoka could have been putting Jedi mind tricks on him, questioning whether he really did have feelings for her. As the untold Ahsoka stories panel told us, Ahsoka and Nyx's relationship would ultimately amount to nothing, and Ahsoka would move on and become an Undercity video vigilante, trying to help anyone she can, despite her not-so-successful attempt this time. This could have been where Dave Filoni originally planned to put her lone samurai story, having it happen off-screen between this arc and the Return to the Jedi Sith Shrine one, having a bunch of off-screen stories where Ahsoka helps anyone she can, but doesn't make as much of a connection as she tried to with Nyx and Lando. This would eventually lead her back to the Jedi in the sadly still unfinished Return to the Jedi Sith Shrine arc, that now if they ever finish it, would have to come before this arc, which is still possible with a bit of reworking, with me having already made a video on that topic.
At the time of the cancellation, this story arc had reached the same stage as the Bounty Hunter arc, Crystal Crisis on Utapau, and The Bad Batch, having completed its main voice acting sessions and story reels for all four episodes. Though like with those arcs, post-production voice touch-ups wouldn't have been performed yet, which means that some background voices or brief secondary characters might have not had dialogue recorded. Nick Sokami had already been cast and voiced, with Matthew Yang King having taken up the role that sadly never got to be seen or heard in full. This was an attempt to get an Asian male lead into the show. It's most likely that Ashley Eckstein had audio sessions with not only Matthew Yang King, but also Billy D. Williams, or another actor to voicing a younger land though, not that any of them would ever be allowed to confirm due to strict NDAs that are no doubt put into place. This story arc was the third out of three arcs that would have made up the second half of season 6, had that been completed in full. concept art of Ahsoka meditating with the Jedi Temple in the distance was created for this story arc by Tara Ruping, but wasn't a sequence in the actual episodes. While I think this concept art was just to represent where Ahsoka was mentally outside of the Order when it was originally created, I think they could potentially repurpose this idea to fit into a version of the Sith Shrine story arc that now has to take place before this one, with this being an Ahsoka who is detached from connecting with people, focusing more on the Force as the only ally she has. This could then lead to her discovering the danger with the Sith Shrine, have her struggle to reconnect with the Jedi, make some sort of short-lived amends, or have some uneasy alliance with them, to follow up on her promise to get Ventress a pardon, which the Jedi utilised to rescue Voss, after he was seemingly captured by Dooku. These events could come off to Ahsoka as seeing the Jedi letting loose another Sith Lord on the galaxy who gets innocents killed. This would cause Ahsoka to leave the Jedi again, slash end her uneasy alliance in attempts to help those who need it, leading her into the path of the Martez sisters, with Ahsoka still ultimately being sad about not being in the Order anymore because she's been alienated by them on multiple occasions. Ahsoka knowing all about the Jedi's plot to assassinate Dooku would also add more context to her mentioning in the Siege of Mandalore about them playing politics. As previously mentioned, I have also covered this change in Ahsoka's timeline in order to fit all her planned arcs into the current continuity in my videos for the Return to the Jedi and the Saving Voss unfinished story arcs. This wouldn't be the first time that they change it so things happen multiple times, as they have done it with the Shadow Collective that now disbands not only at the end of Son of Dathomir, but also at some time between Siege of Mandalore and Solo A Star Wars Story. The new twins Ahsoka D being taller than the original production's Ahsoka D could also play into to the switch of the story arc order, with the original Ahsoka D outfit now potentially being the outfit for the now early in the timeline Sith Shrine and saving Voss story arcs, when Ahsoka is a few months younger and thus not being as tall as she is in later stories. This would also make sense as it seems that her original intended Sith Shrine outfit was used as the basis of her Rebels design, which could discount it from being included in a finished version of the story. Ahsoka's bike was reused for Star Wars Rebels and given to Kanan though the paint job of the bike was changed to green. Speaking of Ahsoka's speeder bike, here is some rarely shared design prototype created by Russell Chong. Just like with the forklift mentioned previously, Russell would have had to initially design these in 2D before picking a specific design to their model in 3D, a standard practice for Clone Wars artists, as stated on Russell's portfolio. The interior of the Silver Angel was repurposed for the Ghost in Rebels after the development team thought this arc would never see the light of day. While the design of the Type 2 load lifter droid was changed for the twins version, the original design was used in a 2017 episode of Forces of Destiny. This could be why they decided to change the droid's design, with JP Bormick creating a new design for the twins production's design phase in 2018. The name Black Ace was reused for a starship seen in Star Wars Resistance. This could be why the starship in the 2020 twins version was renamed to the Silver Angel. For some reason, this arc nor the Sith Shrine arc were referenced in the Ahsoka novel, when a different version of the Siege of Mandalore was, one that seems to have been deliberately made to be forced by Lucasfilm, considering it doesn't match up with either the on-screen version or the early Dave Filoni sketches for the arc. This could have been due to the different medium the story was released in. 
This final version of Ahsoka's walkabout has now been moved forward in the timeline compared to the unfinished one featured in the original production back in 2012, now taking place after Son of Dathomir and Dark Disciple, with Anakin's appearance in the episode Deal No Deal being recontextualized as him leaving for the Outer Rim sieges. Aspects of Nix's characterization seem to make their way into Ezra Bridger from Star Wars Rebels, including his goofy antics and his failed attempts at flirting with Sabine. The same thing also happened with Sabine herself, with Pablo Hidalgo confirming that she was inspired by another character from an unfinished Clone Wars arc, that being Rook Cast from Son of Dathomir. This could have ultimately been the reason why Dave Filoni changed Nyx to Trace when going back and finishing this story arc. While Matthew Yang King's role of Nyx was replaced, he did finally get to have a role in the Star Wars universe within the Young Jedi Adventures, voicing the character of Loden Greatstorm, a Twi'lek Jedi first depicted in the Night of a Jedi novel, a character who is very different to Nyx. While I think this story arc is fine overall and don't hate it as much as some people do, I can personally see how the alterations in the Twins production version seem to actively hinder its original vision. I prefer the original Ahsoka D design over the new mechanic one and hope it will get used in animation one day, especially because Ashley Eckstein even got to have input on the design, choosing the animal Ahsoka had on her boots that is unfortunately covered up by the mechanic overalls in the Twins version. The removal of the romance angle with Trace's characterization hinders her character's actions, with what she does throughout the story making less sense without it, and the ending of the arc now becoming just a promotional time for the Siege of Mandalore, which makes this story feel less important, and more so just to how Ahsoka got from A to B. I also feel bad for Nyx's voice actor, who voiced him for all four of the episodes he was going to appear in, and who made a Facebook post shortly before the final season aired, thinking his character would finally get to be seen. Had this story arc been finished as intended as the season 6 finale, I think it would have been received much better, not being the second to last story arc in a final season it was never meant to be in. Instead, it would have been followed by another two seasons that consisted of 40 more episodes, which would have been 10 more story arcs, including another one with Ahsoka, which would have allowed her to utilize her experience gained in this story in more than just a few scenes in the Siege of Mandalore, where she is initially frosty with Anakin and later argues with Obi-Wan. Part of me feels like this story arc was chosen for budget reasons, with it essentially being one of the most complete unfinished arcs at the time of the cancellation, potentially being just four to six months away from being visually completed when the production was halted. It's a shame that they seem to have been fine with keeping the one line of dialogue that had Rafa called Luminara beautiful, but decided to remove the romantic feelings characterization from Trace, which would have actually tied into the story and explained why Trace is making the decisions she does. Considering Dave Filoni went on to retell the story of the Ahsoka novel without the inclusion of Caden Latte, who was confirmed as a queer identifying character by the novel author E.K. Johnston, it makes it feel like such a wasted opportunity that they did not utilize the pre-existing characterization from Nyx to more fully form the reason for Trace's actions, while also allowing Trace to be some actual representation for queer people that extends beyond a single line of dialogue or a random cuttable scene of a same-sex kiss. Thank you for watching. Please see the video description below for interesting links, sources and credits. And if you enjoyed, please like, subscribe and comment. Until the next time, goodbye.